Um, I'm going to take a bit of a step back now on the kind of journey that we've been going on because so far it's kind of been a chronological story that we started with the first wave of psychology, which was Freud and the psychodynamic perspectives. Um, and then the second wave, which was behaviorism, which then extended to learning theories and social learning, and then the cognitive theories as well. But at the same time as all this was going on, there were also academics who were studying personality through a different lens. And, you know, it wasn't to help with psychotherapy in the way that the theorists we've looked at so far were studying personality to do with they were studying it in a more general sense in order to understand how can it best be studied, how can it be used for research purposes. But at the same time as the depth psychologists were going on, you know, um, Gordon Alpert was doing his work and um, Cattell and Eisnick were doing their work as the behaviorism and the social learning theories were really taking off. And um, so these theories that we're going to cover now were really happening parallel to some of the theories that we've already discussed. But it's not considered a wave of psychology because it didn't impact all areas of psychology. It didn't impact how it was researched, how it was taught, how it was practiced in psychotherapy and so on. It's a more limited domain, right? Now, this is the definition I shared with you on the first lecture by Gordon Alpert, that personality is a dynamic organization inside the person, psychophysical systems, so something that's actually real that we'll go on to talk more about that's, you know, existing on a physical level. Um, and then it's characteristic patterns of behavior, thoughts and feelings. So that triad that we spoke about again in the first lecture. So, you know, in this module, we're going to talk about trait theories, bi biological theories, how they often go hand in hand. And then I'll also touch upon the humanistic theories. Um, what I want to do in this first lecture is really lay the groundwork of how traits were first studied. And then I'll show you how it led to the emergence of the big five model, okay, which you're likely familiar with, that we'll go into more detail though than you've done so before, I imagine. And it's the most popular framework for personality right now in research. Um, so, you know, this is maybe a more accessible idea of personality certainly the 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 one that you probably most think of right when you think of personality you think of traits you think of these kind of characteristics that you can apply to people that describe fairly stable patterns of behavior right you describe someone as being sociable for example because in most contexts they come across as sociable and they come across as more sociable than other people so a trait can really be thought of as a sub-element of personality, right? It's kind of the building blocks of what personality are. It's these labels that we apply to what we think are at least relatively stable patterns of behavior, right? So they characterize a person's typical behavior. But they are problemistic, um, uh, yeah, problemistic in nature, okay? Meaning that if we describe someone as sociable, okay, it doesn't mean that they're going to be sociable in every single context all every single hour of the day, okay? It means that they're more likely to be sociable than someone who's not described as being sociable, okay? And they're more likely to be sociable in a number of contexts. They're more likely to be sociable most of the time. But certainly, obviously, people are not characterized by one trait only, okay? And so it's not necessarily the case that 24 seven, they're gonna be described as being sociable. Now, when it comes to the trait approach, there's really two ideas here that you can use. There is a ideographic approach, okay, coming from the Greek word for person, okay, which means to study the person as a whole, okay. And so if we are using this approach, okay, we study the person and then we think what personality traits characterize them, okay. So we're not going into it with personality traits already in mind to measure, okay. We're just looking at this person, what's the traits that emerge, okay? So this is the approach that Gordon Alpert took that I'll talk about first. The second approach is a nomothetic approach, which is what most of the popular trait theorists took, okay? Hans Eisnick, Raymond Cattell, the big five. With a nomothetic approach, there is a predetermined list of traits that we're then looking to assess in a person, okay? 
So we think that there is a finite set of variables, okay, dimensions, okay, that everyone will fall upon, at least to some extent, okay? Some people will score high, some people will score low, some people in the near the middle. But with the big five, for example, it's obviously a non phetic approach, because already in mind, we have these five dimensions, right, that we're assessing people's personality on, okay? Whereas in, in an ideographic approach, we're not going in with that mindset, okay? We're looking at the person, seeing what traits emerge. We're not actually assessing any particular traits, okay, that we've already predetermined. So Gordon Alpert, um, born 1897, Indiana, youngest of four brothers. Um, one of his older brothers was a social psychologist and Gordon Alpert really looked up to him and he puts this down as being what led him into psychology. Um, uh, he describes his childhood as being, well, he was bullied, he was described as being shy, but pretty academically inclined. Um, and when he went into psychology, you know, depth psychology, of course, led by Freud was the most popular framework at the time. But he thought it tended to look a bit too deeply into things that, you know, actually didn't really need to be looked deeply into, right? Remember, for the Freudian approach, there's always a deeper meaning, right? You didn't do that by accident. You know, you didn't say that by happenstance, okay? There's always a deeper reason, okay? Deep within your unconscious as to why you do everything. Okay, but Alper thought that this wasn't necessarily the case. And, you know, there's a story that's often used in textbooks to illustrate this. And it's that Gordon Alpert was in Europe and he had an invitation to meet with Freud. It's, you know, a pretty big deal. He's pretty new into psychology at this time and he's being invited to meet with the, you know, most well known psychologist in the world. And um, so he goes into Freud's office and he's a little bit nervous and so on. And Freud has a rule that he's, or did have a rule that he spoke about a number of times, and that's that he never spoke first, okay? Whether it was a client or whether it was a guest, he never spoke first. And because, you know, Gordon Alpert's a bit nervous, a bit shy, introverted, it's a little bit awkward at first, no one says anything initially. And then Gordon Alpert thinks, what can I talk about? And he took the bus to get to Freud's office, and he thought he would just share some observations he made on the bus. And he talked about how he saw some um, very neatly put together middle class women who looked very uncomfortable on the bus and who didn't want to touch anything. And she was with her son who looked the same. He looked, you know, very proper and also looked quite disgusted by his environment. Um, and, you know, Alfred was maybe beginning to discuss, you know, what is it that makes a person a person, right? Um, so was the boy like this because of his mother, essentially? But Freud, Freud took a, a, a lean back and thought for a moment and then said, ah, so you're saying this little boy was you, okay? Meaning that, you know, Gordon Alpert was focusing on this because he was projecting something of himself onto the little boy, that there was something with the boy he identified with, okay? But for Alpert, that wasn't the case, okay? There was no deeper meaning to it. It was just an observation that came to mind, okay? Um, so anyway, Gordon Alpert then would study, you know, personality more academically, okay? Um, he became very well cited, was elected president of the APA in 1939. And his 1937 book, Personality, a Psychological Interpretation, uh, was really quite groundbreaking because not only did it really begin this completely different look at personality, this, you know, trait approach and this attempt to empirically study it, um, which was popular then also with academics and other researchers, but also actually had some um, popularity outside psychology as well with like the general public and so on. So it was beginning to make other people aware over how personality is actually conceptualized and how it can be studied. Okay, so Gordon Alpert's lexical approach is the kind of starting point for his theory on personality. And that's the the dictionary contains all of the fundamental ways of describing the main differences between people. Okay, so the lexical hypothesis is that when it comes to the main differences between people, we will we will have came up with words to describe those main differences. Okay, because we are observing those differences, and we then need words to then differentiate between people's characteristics and so on. So there's a word for tidiness. Okay because we can observe the fact that some people are more tidy than others, okay? Um, if there wasn't 
you know, a word for a main difference between people, then it can't be that fundamental. Otherwise, it would have arisen in our language. Okay. And, and I'll come back to this, but, you know, Gordon Alfred did begin by looking through the dictionary, listing all of the adjectives, okay, that were then the starting point for personality traits. <clears throat> For him, also, there's kind of four characteristics of personality traits. Uh, first of all, they are real. They exist within the nervous system, meaning that this isn't just a psychological difference. Okay, there's also some physical reason, okay, for the differences in behavior. Now, Gordon Alpert himself didn't do much work on gene studies and so on. Okay, we'll talk about them a bit later. But he did have the idea, at least, okay, that there was some genetic component or physical characteristic to personality differences. Um, second of all, that personality determines or causes behavior, okay, it's directional in nature. It can be demonstrated empirically, which for him was studying traits. Um, and then also, though, that they can vary with the situation, okay. <clears throat> So, you know, Gordon Alpert, as I say, went through the dictionary. He listed 20,000 adjectives, okay? And then he reduced this list, okay, based upon words that he thought could be applied across cultures, words that had a, a lot of synonyms so that there was overlap with other words. Um, and then eventually he settled on a list of 4,500 words, okay, that he thought were kind of the main personality traits, the main ways of describing people's behavior, the differences between people, and so on. Um, and these 4,500 traits can fall upon three different levels, okay? They can be described as cardinal traits, meaning that it is a dominant trait, okay, within you, okay, that characterizes pretty much all of your behavior, considering what you do in the majority of situations, and so on. So for Gordon Alpert, cardinal traits were very, very rare, okay? Not very many people have a singular trait, okay, that could be used to describe them most of the time. You know, most people are a bit more complicated and it takes a number of traits to describe who they kind of are as a typical person. But, you know, someone maybe with a severe anxiety disorder, okay, might be described as being anxious and that being their cardinal trait. You know, if they're anxious across situations, across time, and that's, you know, quite clearly the main personality trait that's dictating their behavior. Um, or you can think of a more extreme personality trait, like being sadistic, maybe, okay? It's more unusual, okay, but also would likely characterize people in terms of why they're acting as extremely as they are, and likely would also cover a number of situations across time as well. Um, or some some other figures that are used to describe cardinal traits are some more you know unusual individuals such as those who stood up against the the crowd who stood up against the times so think about gandhi and martin martin luther king jr who you know at least in their public lives were really guided by one main principle which was total pacifism and they were you know pushed into situations that were very uncomfortable that most people would react to very differently than they did most people would react with a bit more hostility but because of this guiding principle okay um they were acting differently than most people would at least in their you know public lives um so that's some examples of you know people who might be described as having a cardinal trait but for most people gordon alpert would say they're made up of multiple um central traits and then also some secondary traits that we'll talk about but the central traits are the kind of building blocks of who you are, okay? Your main personality traits. So for Alpert, most people have about five to 10 of these, okay? So, you know, maybe you are a very sociable person, right? Across situations, you're always very sociable across time. Um, but that's not the only trait that describes you, right? Maybe you're also a very friendly person or a very compassionate person, okay? And so those might be some of the central traits, okay, that would be used to describe your main disposition. And then there's secondary traits, okay? They're, they're not prominent enough or consistent enough to be classed as central traits because they vary more from situation to situation and might be situation specific, okay? So maybe you're not typically an anxious person, 
that maybe when sitting a test, you get anxious, or maybe when meeting someone for the per first time, you get anxious. So maybe under certain circumstances, you get anxious, okay? And so then it might be used as a secondary trait for you, okay, to describe your behavior, because it's not a central part of who you are. Any questions so far? Um, now, Alpert also acknowledged that some traits are more common than others, okay, even though he's taking this ideographic approach. So some traits like sociability are possessed by at least most people, at least to some extent, okay, which would be described, therefore, as a common trait. And then there's other traits like the one I said, sadism, right, which is far more unique, okay, which is a more unusual trait, okay, that not very many people possess, okay, according to Alfred. He also believes that attitudes and habits also are capable of directing behavior, and that while these can be interlinked with personality traits, they can also be independent, perhaps based upon your upbringing, for example. So attitudes are those that have a specific point of reference. They include an evaluation on whether something is good or not, essentially an opinion, right? So this could be your opinion on a movie or your opinion on politics or your opinion on religion, religious issues and so on, right? Um, which obviously could be interlinked with your personality traits, right? If you're, you know, particularly sociable, then you're going to likely have a positive attitude towards parties and things associated with being um, sociable that, you know, give you opportunities to be sociable. But also your opinions, your attitudes on things such as religion, politics, they might not be interlinked with your personality. They might be more a product of your upbringing. Okay, that, that, that's what you were taught. And then there are habits. Okay, these are more micro behaviors. Okay, specific responses to specific stimuli. Now, again, these could be interlinked with personality traits. Okay, they could be evidence of a personality trait at a micro level, right? For example, if you're someone who frequently, you know, washes your washes your hands and frequently um making your desk clean and tidy and so on then these might be a habit right because you're doing them regularly enough but they also might be reflective of being an orderly person right so maybe that's your personality traits but you're orderly okay and so obviously there's going to be habits associated with that but also they might be a product again of your environment okay they might be some sort of you know, coping strategy that you um, came up with, for example, for experiencing a particular environmental stressor, or it might be something that you've been taught to do, okay, again, based upon your upbringing. So again, these can be interlinked with traits, but they can also be independent. But again, they will have an influence on your behavior, okay? <clears throat> now, Gordon Alpert had a number of ways of um, measuring personality. Um, interviews, which are um, asking the person to describe themselves and so on, um, which will uncover, you know, their dispositions, their temperaments, they can give some insights into the main traits. Self-reports, but what he's really talking about here, rather than questionnaires, are things like dream um reports a diary entries confessions um could be letters right so looking back at the time in which albert was studying he was for example looking at the letters between people to see how that was reflective of their personality traits of course if he was around today it would be you know emails and text messages and you know also maybe for example your internet history and some other ways of getting insight into what your personality traits might be um, but for example, there was a middle-aged woman called Jenny. Um, Albert looked at her letters going back 20 years. There was over 200 of these letters. Um, and then from studying these letters, he made a list of her main personality traits, okay, based upon, you know, how she um, spoke to the person or um, communicated with the person in writing. Um, he actually also then gave the letters also to other researchers and asked them to also write down a list of the main traits. 
checking for inter-rater reliability, okay? It's an early example of um, this form of reliability. Um, and finding that there was good consistency between the different lists of personality traits. And then also some non-verbal cues, the way that you walk, you know, do you, um, do you, do you walk uh, uh, looking confident or are you more kind of hunched over? Um, and also your handwriting, believing that, you know, big, bold writing reflected a more confident person, whereas smaller handwriting reflected a more timid person. A, a bit a bit similar here to Alfred Adler, right? Who also had some other similar ways of measuring personality from the way that you sat, from the way that you slept, and so on. Okay, so the main takeaway point from Gordon Alpert is the beginning um, of studying trait theory and this lexical approach, okay? Because the lexical approach is really the kind of first step in a series of steps that then leads to the emergence of the big five. Um, now, um, Gordon Alpert has had undoubtedly a large impact on future trait theorists who came after him. Also, the humanistic approach wasn't really around at this time, but he could be described as an early humanist, okay, based upon the fact that he was studying a person at a time and so on. Um, some empirical evidence of his ideas um, in the second half of the 20th century, actually, there was a undergraduate student called Jeffrey Page, who for their honors thesis, decided to also look at these series of letters by Jenny, but then list the main characteristics of Jenny, and then put the results through factor analysis using the emergence of computers and statistical analysis, and founding that through factor analysis, actually, the main personality traits that emerged were also quite similar to the list that um, that Gordon Alpert in initially wrote down, okay, giving further credibility, okay, to this insights he had. Um, there's a common sense appeal, right? It makes sense that the main fundamental ways of describing differences between people will have emerged in our language, okay? That has a, a, a intuitive feel to it. Um, and then he emphasized the role of genetic factors, even if he didn't really study this himself, um, they really may be getting the ball rolling in this area. But he's had pretty little research to test the theory, in, in part because his theory is so ideographic that it's, it's going to be so unique, the results, right? You know, if I gave you a dictionary with 20,000 adjectives, and told you to pick out the main 4,500 personality traits, you wouldn't come up with the same list as Alfred came up with, right? Because the process is so subjective, okay? Um, and also the applications are somewhat limited, right? You can't, for example, make a personality questionnaire that assesses 4,500 personality traits, and it would be hard you know, to have people try to observe these personality traits. So actually, coming up with applications for it is also difficult to do, um, which makes it unsuitable for experimental methods. And again, it's so unique that it's impossible to replicate. Um, and, and then these other tray theorists are more non-phetic. Okay, so I'll say a little bit about Raymond Cattell for 1905, um, countryside of England. And you know, unlike most of the other personality theorists we've looked at, he describes his childhood as being actually pretty normal and not so traumatic as some of the other theorists have described it as being. Um, you know, describes a pretty average upbringing in the English countryside, a lot of fishing and hiking and outdoor time and so on. Um, he pursued his PhD in psychology at King's College London, which is where he worked under Charles Spearman. If you've done any classes to do with intelligence so far, you will have heard of right, who developed factor analysis. And while Charles Spearman was using factor analysis to understand how different measurements of intelligence go together and what was the most fundamental components of intelligence under covering the G factor and so on, um, Raymond Cattell then got the idea to then use it for personality, okay? So this is really why Raymond Cattell is so well known in psychology. He was the first one to use factor analysis for understanding the fundamental cores of personality traits, okay, which is still the main way of studying personality today, okay. Um, 
after graduating with his PhD, he worked in the south of England for a while, then moved to the US and then moved to Honolulu, um, which is where he died in 92. So he had a career in psychology that lasted over 70 years. Okay, so, you know, for those of you who don't know what factor analysis is, it's looking for patterns of co-variation, okay? And then based upon the strength of those patterns, splitting them into factors. So for example, you know, if I gave people a personality questionnaire that contains a number of adjectives and you were asked, does this describe you or not? Or to what extent does this describe you? Then there would be obvious patterns of co-variation. So for example, maybe one of the items are, I am a compassionate person. And one of the items is I'm an altruistic person, right? If we gave this questionnaire to a large number of people, then for the most part, most people who agreed strongly with the first one would also agree strongly with the second one. And people who disagreed with the first one would disagree with the second one. Now, it's, it doesn't mean that these are the exact same, okay? Compassionate and altruistic have differences, but they're clearly very overlapping, okay? And so it's, it's indicating that there is some overlap in terms of the variation here, but also there might be a underlying reason, okay, that's responsible for these patterns of co-variation. So in factor analysis, we look for these patterns of co-variation that then split themselves into factors. So for example, if one of the items was being sociable and one of the items was being talkative and one was being friendly and one was being lively, and one was being extroverted and so on, all these characteristics to do with extroversion, okay? They would all co-vary with each other greatly, okay? And they would form one factor, okay? And then being compassionate and altruistic and agreeable and cooperative and compliant and polite, that would form a separate factor, okay? Because those would all co-vary with each other strongly. So this allows us to see what characteristics correlate with one another but also which characteristics are clearly independent from each other, okay? Because if we had a factor to do with being timid and shy and anxious and withdrawn and nervous, okay? That would be completely independent than the factor I just described about being altruistic and compassionate, okay? So we can see then what the independent factors are of personality and which ones overlap with each other and which ones go together. Now, I'll, I'll show you this, but um, you know, for Raymond to tell, in factor analysis, there's two types of traits. Okay, there is the source trait, which is the trait in the factor that co-varies the strongest with the other traits in the same factor. Okay, which he says is the one most responsible, therefore, for these patterns of co-variation. So, and the the example I described about being sociable, being talkative, and so on. Extroversion might be the word, okay, that co-varies most strongly with all these other words, okay? And so that would be listed as the source traits, okay? Whereas the ones co-varying with it also within the factor would be called the surface traits. Now, for Raymond Cattell, he looked at this list of 4,500 words um, by Alfred and believed that there was a lot of overlap, okay, that it was a bit redundant in places. And so he reduced it to about 160. And then once he had a questionnaire that was measuring all of these about 160 traits, um, he gave it out to hundreds of people, and then he put the results for a factor analysis. And for him, he found that there were 16 factors, okay, that emerged for, six, for factor analysis. So what we have here are 16, therefore, source traits. Okay, and then the surface traits, okay, based upon the factor tied to that particular source trait. So, for example, we have a factor that has six characteristics, okay, co varying strongly. We have warmth, we have comforting, supportive, which all co vary strongly in a positive direction, and then aloof, cold, and detached, okay, which positive which correlate with the others, but obviously in a negative direction. Now, what he's found is that in that factor of six traits, warmth was the one that co-varied the strongest. Okay, so it has the strongest level of correlation with these other five traits within that factor. 
So that's therefore been labeled as the source traits. Okay, the others have been classed as surface traits. Um, whereas, for example, if we look to anxiety, okay, there's five characteristics in this factor, okay, that that co-vary with each other strongly. We have anxiety, which positively correlates with being apprehensive and insecure, and then negatively con correlates with being confident and self-assured. Anxious is the one that's correlated most strongly with those other four. So it's been listed as the source trait, and the others have been listed as the surface traits. Okay. Does that make sense? Is there any questions? Now, I think what you'll see here is that there is still some overlap. Okay. You could argue that some of these factors are not entirely independent. Okay. But keep in mind that the the ability to use factor analysis was somewhat limited at this point, okay? But as we'll see, as things improve, we can further reduce, okay, um, in order to see what the actual main independent factors are, which is then what emerges the big five. Um, you may also note this second factor, intellect, okay? Other trait theorists like Eisnick was very much of the opinion that intelligence is not a personality trait, okay, that it's separate. But for Raymond Cattell, it, it has been described as one of the factors of personality, okay. So there's 16 factors here, 16 source traits. Um, and Cattell does have a questionnaire, the 16 factors personality questionnaire. It was popular for a very long time in the 20th century, really until the Big Five became much more popular. Um, and it was used for recruitment purposes, screening out for certain jobs. You know, if you want, you know, a particular makeup of a person for a particular job, like maybe being an uh, being a pilot, for example, you might want certain traits, like being a bit self-assured and not being very anxious. Okay, when you're under pressure and so on. Um, so it might be used for purposes such as that, okay, so that you're getting the most desirable characteristics for your um, new hire. Now, um, Cattell also has other ways of splitting up traits, okay, for him, some are called constitutional traits, meaning that they are determined by genetics, and some are called environmental mode traits, meaning that they're molded by the environment. Um, now, Cattell was one of the first to do twin studies looking at the heritability of personality traits. I'm going to save that till we talk about the biological evidence um, more broadly. Um, but he was right that some traits are more heritable than others. Okay, some have a more of a genetic influence than others. Okay, um, and he was really one of the first to make this distinction within traits. He then also has ability, temperament, and dynamic traits, another way of splitting up traits. So ability are those that are to do with your, your skills, your ability to deal with a situation. So this could be an in, in, intellect, okay? How intelligent you are will impact your ability to do a particular task, okay? Remember for Cattell, intelligence is being considered a personality trait. Then the temperament ones are to do with your typical behavioral style. Are you a more laid back person? Are you more of a type A personality always on the go? Okay. And then dynamic, which is those that motivate you to engage in behavior. So maybe being particularly artistic, for example, is obviously going to motivate you to engage in the arts. Now, I'm just briefly going to cover this. Okay, this is different ways that Cattell had of splitting traits. It, it did go more deep than this, okay? But I don't really want to spend much time on it because it wasn't picked up at all by anyone who came after Cattell. Um, and so it isn't really seen as being useful, okay, for studying personality traits. But for example, when talking about dynamic traits, he believed that some were ergs, which are dynamic traits that are genetic in nature. And then some are called socially shaped manif socially shaped ergenic manifolds okay which are those determined by the environment a term that didn't get picked up who knows why okay it rolls off the tongue so easily um 
But he also had some complicated ideas about how these kind of interlink with each other. And again, as a part of the theory that just hasn't been picked up. For Cattell, he's best known, okay, for his work on factor analysis. He also used three different sources for studying um, personality. Again, I won't spend much time on this because we've already covered it in the first lecture, okay? But it's the L data, which is your life outcomes, okay? Some objective numbers such as the number of parties you attend, the number of traffic accidents, okay? Um, Q data, which is typically self-reports, okay? But it could be informant reports, but it's some questionnaire data. And then T data, which remember is experiments, tests, and Cattell's time, it's more projected tests. It's more like the roche blocking flock test and things like that, okay? But nowadays, for T, for T data, we would usually use experiments, right? I told you about, for example, the distractibility experiment in which we might you know, measure someone's reaction time when there is a distraction, and then their reaction time when there isn't a distraction, see the difference, and that will give us some insights into how easily distracted they are by distractions in the background. <clears throat> Okay, so, you know, Cattell is taking into account the importance of biology and the importance of the environment. Like I say, he had some twin studies that also give evidence, okay, for this part of the theory. Um, it's a very comprehensive theory, okay? He, he wrote in, a great, in great detail on, on traits, okay? What makes up a trait, the different ways of categorizing traits. Um, and it recognizes the complexity because it allows you to make independent distinctions, okay? You can determine if something is, for example, a genetic um, trait in nature or if it's molded by the environment. And then you can also separate from that, determine if it's a ability trait or a temperament trait or a dynamic trait. Um, and then we also have the use of unique traits and common traits, okay, that I talked about when talking about Alpert, but also was used by Cattell as a way of differentiating traits. Um, and there is empirical evidence, okay? Um, but his obscure language has meant he's had very little impact other than the results of his factor analysis, okay? Um, these terms like socially shaped, ergenic manifolds, okay, it's obscure language, okay, that's not very accessible or inviting. And also factor analysis, is a bit more subjective than you might uh, first think, okay? It, it sounds very scientific and it's using statistical analysis, but actually there's some subjectivity in determining what constitutes a factor, okay? It's determining the kind of threshold for co-variation and so on. Um, and especially at the time in which Cattell was doing it, okay, in which there was more limitations, okay, in the amount of factor analysis that you could actually do. Now, I just briefly want to mention um, the personality type perspective, okay? When I talk about dispositional theories, that's an, that's an umbrella term for trait theories and type theories, okay? Trait theories are, of course, studying traits, okay, that either make you up from an ideographic point of view or that people score on on different levels from a non fetic point of view. Um, whereas the type approach obviously is categorizing people into types, okay? Um, some of these we've already looked at. We've looked at Carl Jung, who has the cognitive functions, believing that your dominant cognitive function described your personality traits so that there were initially eight personality types. And then the Myers-Briggs, which was produced after his work, inspired by his work, that there are 16 types and then Roseman and Friedman, the two cardiologists who developed the type A and type B personalities. Um, but again, I'll talk a bit more about in the fourth module when we talk about the applications of psychology for the field of health. Okay, but I'll give you just an, an initial idea um, for now. Now, we've already talked about the myers briggs in detail. We've talked about the strengths and limitations, but remember it's pretty frequently used by organizational um, psychologists and HR departments. 
a million or so um, every year, and a number of the top 100 companies in the US use it for recruitment or hiring purposes. Um, it has been shown to be effective at some level. Okay, It does predict some differences in management styles, for example, between thinkers and feelers, differences between sensors and intuitives in terms of how they process information, what they pay attention to. Are they paying attention to small details like sensors or the big picture like intuitives? Um, it has attempted to, to support union theory, these stacks of cognitive functions, and it's easy to use, right? You've all taken a Mars Briggs test at this point. The results are, you know, pretty easy to swallow, pretty easy to digest, right? In terms of understanding what it says about your personality, how you're different from other people, um, and it's a pretty inoffensive tool as well, meaning that there are no ideal types or types that are less ideal. Okay? Every type has their own strengths and weaknesses. And it does try to explain personality, why there are differences rather than just describing observations. Okay. But obviously it's very overly simplistic, okay, believing that people can be categorized into types. It's arguing that there are basically no um within group differences and large between group differences okay whereas you know if someone scores you know 51 on an extraversion questionnaire and someone scores 100 they might both be on the high end but are they going to be the same in reality probably not because one scored much higher than the other in extraversion um and so th the methodology for these questionnaires typically is pretty flawed okay in the original Myers Briggs assessment, it would be done by someone who is trained in the cognitive functions, okay? But most of the time, that is too time consuming and laborious. So, most of the time, it's some sort of survey, right? That splits you based upon what side of the average you fall upon, okay? If you're above average and extroversion, you're an extrovert. If you're below average and extroversion, you're an introvert, okay? Now, that's problematic because we know from personality questionnaire results that most people score near the middle okay there are not two peaks okay there's not you know one at the high end and one at the low end the opposite is what emerges most people score near the middle very few people at the extremes and um, it's also therefore not surprising why reliability on these questionnaires is poor okay half of people who take the test a second time get a different type the second time they take it okay because if you're near the middle you only have to score slightly different to maybe be on the other side of the average than you did the first time. Okay, so therefore it's not surprising that these online instruments are better at capturing the personality of those who score more extremely. Okay, and they're not, not so good at ca capturing the personality of those who score more moderately. <clears throat> now, Roseman and Friedman, like I say, two cardiologists who in the 1970s developed this type A, type B idea. Um, type A are those who are always on the go. They're ambitious. They're competitive. They're no nonsense. They're a bit hostile in their temperament. Okay. Always wanting to be um, number one, essentially. And then the type B is much more laid back. Okay. They're much less urgent. Okay much more go with the flow, a bit less ambitious, less competitive, and so on, okay? Now, I'll talk more about the research backing this up in the fourth module, okay? But Roseman and Friedman have done several studies finding that type A's are more prone to certain health risks, such as heart disease and heart attacks, um, likely because of the stress that they put themselves under, okay? the pressure that they put themselves under, always wanting to be the best and always being on the go. Whereas this more relaxed approach to life comes with less stress and less pressure. Now, there's real world implications of this. Okay, it's used within the field of health. Um, again, that we'll come back to talk more about. Results have been replicated by other researchers. And there is some evidence of a genetic component to the type A personality. So type A children are more likely to have type A parents, in part because the characteristics that make up the type A personality are somewhat heritable, okay, that we'll talk more about. Um, but it's really simplifying pretty complex behaviors, you know, reducing 
all of these differences in characteristics to only differences in two types. Um, it's mostly males that have been studied in this field. And the characteristics that make up a type A personality are actually not that correlated, okay? Because when we break it down, type A is essentially low agreeableness and high conscientiousness, okay? It's made up of traits such as being industrious and um, always on the go and traits to do with being hostile and not very patient, okay? And agreeableness and conscientiousness um, are not strongly correlated with each other, okay? So actually what the type A characteristic is making up are traits that are not really that closely tied together. But regardless of whether one is a trait theorist or a type theorist, all dispositional theorists share the same three, three assumptions, okay? First of all, the people are different from each other and that this can be measured, okay, using questionnaires or other measurements. Second of all, that there is a degree of consistency to people over time, okay? Obviously, it might manifest itself differently, okay? Maybe you were a disagreeable child who is prone to tam temper tantrums and so on. It's not likely that you're still having temper tantrums and so on, but you might be disagreeable in other ways. You might be a bit argumentative um, or so on. And then lastly, that these traits are consistent across situations, okay? Now, what we'll see is that there is very good evidence for the first two traits, the first two assumptions, rather. These are not really disputed, okay? People do score differently on measurements, assessing personality. The first one is held up. And there is a good degree of stability to personality measurements across time, okay? So the second one also pretty well holds up. The third one is the most disputed one, because you're not always consistent across situations, right? You might be different with your parents than you are with your friends. You might be different with them than you are at work. You might be different there than you are at school and so on. Okay, so people do vary from situation to situation. And as social psychology has looked at, the situation also can be very powerful in determining behavior and making sure that people behave in a pretty uniformed way, okay? <clears throat> so, one example of a dispute over the third assumption is this research looking at how much people differ typically from themselves, okay, based upon the situation to situation, which is the darker, darker bar, and then how much people differ on average from each other, okay, which is the lighter bar. And as you can see, for the most part, people actually differ more from them from themselves depending upon the situation okay than their overall score in comparison to someone else's overall score okay so at once social psychology really began to take off um, in the 1960s especially there began to be a lot of criticism towards the personality perspective you know in part Psychology at this time, remember, was really focused on understanding why the events of World War II had happened. And a lot of the studies were studying um, what may have led to, for example, the Holocaust and other um, atrocities that happened in Nazi Germany. And initially, it was all personality perspectives that were popular, okay, that the Germans were high in fascism and authoritarianism and these other traits, okay, that could be measured, okay, that were therefore responsible for their behaviors. But with the emergence of social psychology and the lab studies that they were doing, it was proving that actually this wasn't the case, okay? That even here in the US, lab studies such as the Milgram experiments and Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment shows that under extreme circumstances, people also would adapt to the situation. They would also get quite power hungry. They may also obey authority without question, okay? So regardless of personality traits, the situation had big impacts on behavior. And so social psychology then began to become much more popular. Michelle, who was a social learning theorist, um, but also like Julianne Rotter, was someone who also began to bridge the gap between social learning and cognitive theories. Um, he developed a list of criticisms about the personality perspective. He was by far the most 
well known and vocal, okay, over situationism, which is the, the idea that the situation is what governs behavior. He was even interviewed on late night talk shows and so on, talking about personality research and how it was completely flawed and how social psychology was now taking over and personality was becoming something of the past. Um, and you know the criticism was so strong that personality research basically halted for a couple of decades. There was basically no personality research done during that time. And the main points of Michelle's argument were that, first of all, the situation is more important than personality traits. Traits are not useful predictors, therefore. And the personality assessments are a waste of time because of social desirability and other issues. And also that we overestimate behavioral consistency. Meaning that if we look at the correlation, for example, between personality traits and behaviors, the correlations very rarely exceed 0.4, okay, which is kind of moderate at best. Um, but also that's referring to how consistent people are from situation to situation, okay, which again can be moderate at best. And so this really began the person situation debate, okay. Is it the person um, that is responsible for their behavior, such as their own personality traits and makeups? Or is it the situation, okay, that governs behavior? So, you know, examples of this are like the Zimbardo prison experiment, right? So the basement of Stanford University was turned into a mock prison. Um, volunteers from the university were split at random into being either prisoners or guards, and they had to um, take on these duties, okay, the prisoners ruling over the, uh, the guards rather ruling over the prisoners. And they took to their roles all too well, right, so much so that the experiment had to be cut short because the, um, the guards were being pretty um, relentless in some cases in terms of how they were treating the prisoners. So it was, it's used as evidence of the situation being important, right? But of course, there is some disputes to that, right? If you've taken my forensic psych course, you'll know that we break this down a bit more and we'll see that there was still individual differences, okay, within those groups, okay? Some were a bit nicer to the prisoners than others, for example, okay? So there were still evidence of personality traits. Um, and so eventually the, the person position developed some rebuttals, okay, to Michelle's arguments. You know, that his review of the literature was actually very unfair, that, Basically, all of the arguments coming to support situationism were coming from lab studies in which the situation is very extreme, okay? But in your day-to-day -day life, in which situations are more ambiguous, this might be when personality traits are more likely to influence behavior, okay? Because there isn't such a powerful situation governing behavior. Point four is not that small of a correlation. Again and again, we see the correlation of point four between conscientiousness and university grades. It explains 16% of the variance. It's therefore not the only thing explaining why there's differences in university grades. Obviously, there's lots more that go into it, but it's undoubtedly part of the picture, okay? And then traits clearly exist, okay? Alpert's lexical hypothesis um, demonstrates this, right? If, if there wasn't such a thing as personality traits, main differences between people, we wouldn't have words for describing those differences. You know, I describe something as being tidy because they're more tidy than someone else. It's a stable pattern of characteristics to do with them versus someone else. <clears throat> so nowadays, interactionism is agreed upon, okay, which is that there is an interaction between the situation and the person that both are responsible, okay, for one's behavior. So, you know, the effects of personality can depend, of course, upon the situation, but also the situation can impact people differently. Okay, there's still individual differences, even in extreme situations. Um, people can find themselves in certain situations depending on their personality. Okay, so situational selection, okay, you often select situations that are in line with your personality. If you're a sociable person, you go to situations like parties and so on, okay, that are sociable in nature. If you're thrill seeking, you're more likely to go on roller coasters or you know go skydiving or do something that's going to give you some adrenaline rush. And then also evocation, that sometimes people can evoke something consistently in their environment 
based upon their personality. You know, if you find yourself getting into argument after argument after argument after argument, it might not just be coincidence. It might not be the case that you're just, you know, unfortunately getting yourself into these situations. It might be something about your nature, your personality that's argumentative or combative, okay, that's bringing about uh, an argument in the situations that you're in. And then lastly, people can choose how to act and the situations that they want to act this way versus that way, which is manipulation. You can, for example, be charming in a situation to get on someone's good side or to get what you want, okay? You can adapt your situation consciously, your personality consciously rather, to suit the situation that you're in. <laughs> Any questions so far? Now, the strength of the situation also matters, okay, and differs. So, for example, situational specificity is when you might behave in a certain way under certain situations, okay, such as getting test anxiety. You're not necessarily a typically anxious person. It's not a typical component of your disposition. But there are certain situations, okay, that evoke it. So, for example, when setting a test. But also some situations are strong meaning that they produce a pretty uniformed range of responses, okay? So, for example, at a funeral, you know, there isn't one person jumping up and down and one person dancing on the spot and one person running around. You know, people are all behaving pretty much the same way because there's a general expectation over how you behave at funerals, okay? So in some situations in which the situation is strong, it's going to have a large impact on behavior and personality traits are going to play little importance over differences in behavior. But when the situation is weak, when it's more ambiguous, this is when people will re react and behave differently based upon their personality traits, okay? Which is why, remember, in personality research, what we're interested in is an aggregation, okay? The average view of someone's personality, how they act, the majority of the time, okay? We don't want to know how they behave in one situation, okay? We want to know how they behave in a range of contexts, okay? So we can get an overall big picture of their personality. And that's why therefore personality traits can be used to give some probability over someone, over how someone will behave. But it doesn't mean we necessarily know how they will behave in every situation, okay? Because obviously there's going to be an interaction with the situation, okay? But if someone is highly sociable, they're more likely to be sociable, okay, than someone who scores low in sociability, okay, regardless of the situation, but obviously there's going to be still an interaction. Okay, um, any questions on anything I've covered today? Okay, and then next time we'll talk about how this list that Cattell has has been reduced further to the big five, okay, which is where we'll take it off next time. Thanks, everyone.